Welcome to the Data Leadership Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony J. Algman. Data is everywhere in our businesses, and it takes leadership to make the most of it. We bring you the people, stories, and lessons to help you become a data leader. Today on Data Leadership Lessons, we welcome Peter Schaefer. Peter is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Everest Communications. Everest is a digital communications firm that provides counsel and program execution support to companies in the areas of analytics, social media strategy, and digital reputation repair. Peter, welcome to the show. Anthony, great to meet you. Thank you very much for having me. So like we do with all our first time guests, just take a moment and tell the audience a bit more about your career before Everest Communications and how that journey led you to doing what you do now. Sure. I actually was on two parallel paths for most of my career. One uh, is on the data side. I've worked with uh, Gallup Poll, Harris Poll, uh, several market research companies on on actually the gathering of data, uh, mostly public opinion data. Um, and then the second side has been on the communications and public relations side. So a lot of the work that we did was actually taking the data and then making it media ready, explaining what the implications of the data are, what the data is saying, what directional things we can uh, draw from that. So I've worked in a number of uh, PR firms uh, throughout my career, and that's actually how I met the people at Everest Communications. And uh, that's how we started to work together a couple of years ago. And then I came on staff um, full time with them. But um, so that's that's my background. Um, you know, data has been a part of almost every role that I've had since I came out of college. And um, and most of it, again, has been around market research and polling. So it's uh, been been interesting to see the shifts in public opinion and what that looks like over the last uh, 25 plus years. Interesting. So I last week, uh, I had a conversation with someone who runs a digital marketing agency in Chicago, and he came out of the financial uh, space and, and had done a lot of like hedge fund management and, and things like that, and that, that financial analyst stuff. And, and the, the parallels really surprised me, because the kinds of analysis that you do is not terribly dissimilar. Like there's a lot of similar kinds of, of number crunching, but it got me thinking, and I'm glad that we're having you on the show today because you're in a slightly different, but related type of area. And it, it got me thinking around like this whole notion of polling and surveys and, and how we are trying to understand this world around us. Right. And I I'm curious, like, there's so many areas that as a person who likes to work with data, like, and that's probably so, you know, most of the audience for this show, we all enjoy working and crunching numbers to some extent or another. We at least appreciate what the uh, data can do for, for an organization. But what is really different and interesting amongst each of us, it seems, is that we get pulled into a direction. We find this passion for a particular area, a particular domain, or a particular kind of analysis, or a particular kind of technology that we just naturally gravitate to. So can you talk about why, for you, you gravitated to this area versus potentially something else and and maybe what it is about it that you particularly enjoy sure um I, I actually stumbled into it by mistake i guess um i actually was a client who was using polling data and marketing data to make decisions around uh advertising placement and and this is back pre-social media mm -hmm. um and uh one of my clients actually approached me about coming in house for Gallup poll and working with them. And the, the, the one area that, that really I was very passionate about and continue to be passionate about is using the polling data to really understand what is motivating and driving the public towards a particular uh, opinion, a particular set of behaviors. Um, and, and just to continue to be curious as to why that's evolving and why that's changing. Um, so at, at, during my time at the Allop poll and at Harris poll, I spent a lot of time looking at voter behavior, a lot of time looking at consumer behavior and, and, you know, and, and how and why people moved around. And, you know, there was always some nugget that we would pull out. Um, but the second part that was, that I'm very passionate about is helping other people who are not very familiar with data, understand the implications of what the data is saying and, and what the underlying reasons are for potential shifts in, um, in that data. And, you know, it's, I, I think one of the things that, you know, I joke about is that today everybody's a consultant in some form or fashion. So they all automatically have, like you said, those set of answers that, that they hold true to and that they find data to support those answers. Um, you know, in, in my business, I have to go in with kind of more of a clean, clean slate and, and kind of an open mind about what we think the data is going to say versus trying to get data to prove what 
we already think is our our world view. Um, so it's it is it is pretty interesting. In fact, I've just um, finished a blog post uh, yesterday about some of the polling data from the elections in Virginia and New Jersey, mm -hmm. and you know, and how that is is actually creating decisions by these candidates in real time um, where they place their advertising what messaging they use what issues they they jump on and um, or they use in their campaign uh, advertising so it, it, you know there is a real, real world application that I like you get to actually see your work in 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 um, you know play out in real time or real life so yeah, well, it, 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 it's kind of one of the basic tenets that I've, I've long advocated for in, in data analytics. And as we're building, you know, I build platforms, build systems for organizations. And one of the things that I always coach them on is, you know, you need to have an ability to analyze and act in a relatively similar amount of time. And that yep. is if you are making decisions that manifest over months, you don't need real time analytics at all. If you are literally making a decision this morning for something that happened yesterday, you're going to want some things that are pretty quick. If you are a trader, you need to have microsecond type of reaction times because that's how quickly you are interpreting and adjusting to that data. So the polling data is yeah. really interesting because you are probably in a similar type of pattern of like you want things as close to now as possible because if it starts to get a time delay, you are going to be working with inherently imperfect information that could hurt more than even having a suboptimal analytics approach. Exactly. And, you know, you, you bring up two very important points about the immediacy of data now versus, you know, back in the in the, uh, you know, I shouldn't say dark ages of data collection or polling, but, um, you know, it, having access online to so many millions of people and being able to get those immediate reads are certainly possible today and, and are being used. Um, one of the issues that I think has said that the, the research industry has struggled with is that they have not updated the types of questions that they are asking. So they're taking questions that you know, have been proven mathematically to, to really be uh, very good and, and get and elicit the reactions that you want. Um, but just transferring them over to new technology doesn't necessarily give you a, a better view of the world. So you, yeah, you get the data immediately, but you're asking a, a tired and maybe older question. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you, you know, you probably have picked up on that. Is that if I ask, you know, whether the country's on the right track or wrong track, um, you know, which is a, a very typical question in polling, um, you know, that may resonate differently today than it would even 10 years ago. So updating that type of question is important, but the, 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 the mechanisms exactly are right. You know, we can get now, you know, I, I, this is a, a ballpark, but you can get as many as 300 responses in less than an hour for a particular question, whether it's on a pricing issue, whether it's on a reputational issue, whether it's on an event that happened and your reaction to that event. And that does help marketers. It helps uh, people in, in, you know, my area of crisis communication or in, in, you know, reputational management, um, to get, uh, to get an immediate read and to use that as, um, a baseline for additional action. Yeah. You know, it, it, it brings up, cause you just mentioned something that I want to touch on before I get to the biggest question that's been in my mind since I, <laughs> since we started talking. But the, the first thing is, is when we think about, you know, something that has such a rapid response. So I'll, I'll use an example. I just bought a new car. And yep. like a lot of people are buying a new car, I was on the message board for that car model and I'm reading all about it or whatever. And I knew I had a skewed perspective to some extent because the people that are more inclined to post on that board either have an exceptionally good experience or more likely an exceptionally bad experience, right. which will sway my perception of overall quality and likelihood of issues and things like that. And so when you have those kinds of, of, opt in types of responses like you said hey we might get 300 responses very quickly to me i wonder like how do you manage or control for that self selection issue when certain groups are going to be more inclined to be more vocal than than others how do you even control for that you know that's that's a great question and i'll i'll talk about it in two different ways one thing that that one explosion in data has been on on what we call the qualitative side, which is the message boards and things like that, you know, where people are actually sharing their um, experiences, their opinions in, in, in a more um, 
in an unstructured way. So it's not scalable, things like that. The, the one technique that, that a lot of companies are now starting to use is taking those message boards and taking the commentary, put them into um, artificial intelligence tools and start sorting out mm-hmm. patterns of, of different words and you know, try to match up sentiment. Certainly it's not a perfect science, but it is a better way to, to go about you know, back in the old day, you would have a coder take a file of the verbatims from a survey, you know, open-ended question, and and do exactly the same thing. And now, obviously, the technology is is there. Um, the the balance to that, though, Anthony, is exactly what you said: is that there is polling data almost on every topic and every information, and in there, those are structured and and kind of um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? More mathematically uh, acceptable methodologies to actually get to what you're talking about. So if, if on your new car that, you know, let's say it's, um, you know, brand X has a, you know, 72% customer satisfaction rate, and then you go to the message board and you see, you know, that, that you know, maybe it's 50-50 in terms of whether people like it or not, you at least have now two data points to kind of, to say one is quantitative, the other is qualitative, and then you can make a decision from there. From my standpoint, from the analysis, and, and this is what we help executives with, is that they often get both of those sets of data and can't make sense of, well, what about this? What about this? Um, I will tell you that in, in some regards that the default now is more towards the qualitative information, just because there's so much of it, versus mm-hmm. the quantitative information, which there is a finite set of. Um, and that's one of the big differences now. So. It, it, and it makes some sense that, you know, this is a problem that can be solved to an extent, at least at the pattern level, at the aggregate level. Like once you learn some of the best practices around sifting through some of that inconsistency, then that applies in many situations. And so as a as an expert polar, as a person who does this professionally, you're going to be able to navigate that with tools and techniques that are probably not as accessible, if not available to general business people like myself, for example. Uh, no, that's that's true. And, and you know, the, the, the science is evolving all the time because obviously there's just so much data that you can start working with. You had mentioned something earlier that I, I, I you know, kind of joke with, with, you know, math is math and statistics mm-hmm. are statistics. And so there's a lot you can do within that. But ultimately, what we're in the business of is math. And so when we come up with these designs and are working with these large data sets, um, you know, it comes down to statistical modeling and math. And, and these are all tools that have been around for, for a long time and are fine tuned. So we feel like in, in many regards, um, we may be able to give both directional information, but also data to support that in a way that is certainly not perfect, but it is going to be more um real world than just making a gut decision on it. Um, you know, and, and, and we, again, like I said, you know, in my work, we work on individual brands, we work on mega brands, we work on global brands. And in that case, then you're piecing together a much bigger puzzle. Um, and what we're really looking for at that point are, you know, trends that we see within the data that help at least make the decision or make the action point, as you mentioned, clearer to the decision makers. So, yeah. And, and, and yeah, that's, that's interesting. I didn't even have a question ready because I was so, I was uh, like, <laughs> um, but so let's, let's shift gears. Cause I want to get to the big question sure. or the, the big thing that I wanted to say as a result of, of, of this conversation, then we'll come back to uh, some of the techniques and, and some of the more advanced stuff. Cause I think like we've just been talking about, like, this is the, the, you know, the current, you know, best of breed, the most complex stuff that's out there. And it's fascinating, but it may also be a little bit advanced for folks that haven't really spent a lot of time talking about this. And I gonna tell you a little bit about something like we all have these moments in our careers and in our lives where we have something that we learn or something that we experience, and then we never look at the world quite the same way ever yep. again. And for me in this space, I will never forget many years ago, sadly, many years ago now, um, I had the opportunity to, to get an MBA and, and like my MBA, probably like I could probably just write like a short book of like all the quips and little things, little nuggets <laughs> that are still in my brain from that entire, you know, two and a half years. Um, but one of the moments that forever has terrified me ever since is when I took a marketing research class and I learned, like I've long known that 
sometimes surveys, sometimes analysis, you know, they, they come with a preconceived notion of the answer in mind. And then everything yep. kind of fits to support that this kind of data. I've, I've, I've coined the term data justified is where we have our idea. And then we look for the data to, to, you know, support that idea. That's just bad. Like we get it. Like that's just bad analysis. That's bad scientific method or what have you. But what really terrified me in this marketing research class is not only did I start to learn about all the techniques and stuff that, you know, focus groups and surveys and all these things, but I learned just how bad most surveys are <laughs> and how much unintended slant or bias creeps into these things. And then at that point, I never could look at a survey the same way again. And it, it, it terrifies me, people that are intending and thinking that they are doing great market research are completely introducing bias that makes that entire effort unworthy to be done at all. And so from an expert opinion, I want to understand from you, how do you deal with that? And even how do you even just manage like a, the survey monkeys that I'm sure like everybody else you get, and it's just like, you, you, you must not enjoy some of that. Well, I, I, you know what, you just brought up something and I'm, I'm not going to, uh, name names, but, um, the, the, what the DIY survey industry has blown up which is great i guess but it has created a lot of horrendous research and mm -hmm. you and, and some really really poor decisions um and and there's unfortunately not a great way to police that and and you know and and it, because it's now so easy and it's so cheap even some really sophisticated and and what i would you know term you know really really sh just you know, sharp research minds are defaulting to using that for just these casual one-off or, you know, quick down and dirty type research projects. Um, one of the fallacies that people get caught in, and, and you mentioned it a little bit, is that the more responses I have, that means the error rate is less, and that means I'm, I'm, you know, stronger. But if you still have a crappy question, you're going to get a crappy answer, <laughs> and that's and regardless of whether you have two thousand or five thousand, um, and that's the part that I'm seeing is that you're getting really, really biased questions being asked that don't number one don't give the respondent a real sense of what it is they're they're trying to do. The second is you give them the opportunity to actually give a more biased answer um you know I, I i don't i mean this is probably too far in the weeds but you know i've seen now a number of surveys come back with these what what are called binary responses it's yes no mm -hmm. um and those are the only two options that you have um you know people are more sophisticated than that they're, they're used to set, uh, ranges of of you know degrees of the way they feel or whatever and, and yes no is, is really a hard line on some of these things and i've seen the reemergence of those questions just because they're easy they're quick and um and i think for marketers they can then say well you know it's 62 percent yes and that's why we're going in this direction um one of the things that that we used to and this is back you know there used to be a lot of research on research that was done meaning that um and there's a there's a technique called clustering where you ask the same question using different versions of that question and you mm -hmm. look at how the uh answers get clustered and the um the, the, the science behind it was pretty simple is that the more you have clustered in the middle, the kind of less strong that question was um, because it, you know, it, oh, yeah. for, you know, the way, the way we would describe it is we don't, you know, you, you want to, you don't want to see a lot of threes. That's kind of a neutral position. So if they clustered in the middle, that meant the question really didn't kind of get to the issue. If you saw the clustering at the, at the extremes or closer to the extremes, then you knew you had a question that was going to be, uh, or allow the respondent to at least give a more, um, in, you know, a, a more natural or more truthful answer. Um, and, the, you know, in, in one regard, what you were talking about, the message boards is mm -hmm. kind of a reflection of that is that it's the yeah. two extremes and, you know, versus the people in the middle. Um, but one of the things was, and, and this is used a lot in the market research side, uh, um, and especially on ad testing and, and message testing, um, is that those two extremes allow you to create different messages for different target audiences so that you can 
you know, you can say, all right, here are the three messages, six messages we're going to use, and we're going to use it with this audience, this audience. That's where the magic has started to come back for some of the clustering analysis, because it now gives you, okay, this is going to play well with this audience. This is not going to play well with this audience. So, but that's, that's, you know, again, there's no way to, um, to really prevent against the bias. The one thing that I, I that where the bias I think now has shifted a little bit too, is that because fewer and fewer people are taking surveys or the same people are taking more surveys is that, you know, you have this phenomenon of a professional survey taker and they know, you know, <laughs> theoretically how to maneuver. Um, that's put more pressure on the researchers to create weighting schemes on the back end when they're doing their analysis to balance that out. So the balancing part of it is now more on the back end than it is on the front end. And that's, you know, again, mm -hmm. a, a sometimes a factor of math. Um, we were talking about this in public polling because, you know, the, that that's become a big issue, especially for telephone surveys, because, you know, most people aren't, and it's, it's, you know, the waiting on the back end is trying to sort out and, and, you know, make sure that, um, that it is quote unquote, as representative as it can be. So, yeah. You, and you just mentioned phone polling and that just made me think, I'm like, there's gotta be a challenge with, how the mechanisms people use to communicate evolve because like I won't answer my phone even if I know the person calling me certainly yeah. not going to answer it if I don't know the person calling me and and I know that that's kind of a trend that you know you won't get you can't pick up the phone and get a representative sample of anybody at this point um yeah. you know knowing I mean, it, that it, it it takes I'll, I'll give you this example it used to be that for every one survey response you would get, you'd need to make six phone calls. Now it's one to probably about every 70. Um, mm -hmm. And so it takes now instead of, you know, 24 hours to 48 hours, it's taking a week to get to it. Um, and, and then you're still relying on the, um, the respondent telling you that, yeah, this is that I'm, I'm X or that, you know, they're, they're basically confirming the information that you have. So it's still not that, you know, it's, there's still some gaps in, in that. Um, it used to be, random digit dial because everybody had a landline or at least 98% mm -hmm. of the population did, you could randomize those telephone numbers and, and have a good cell phones. It's a lot different because you have, you know, there, there are different logistics um, and there are different laws around and mm -hmm. regulations around, you know, who you can call and who you can't. The one big trend though, is I think a lot of market researchers have basically said, this is, you know, through marketing, this is our target audience. So we're okay with the bias of talking to this target audience because that's actually who our customer is. So the default is we're just going to embrace the bias and use that to fine tune or to create new product uh, lines or new brands because we now know who we want to talk to. Um, so that, 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 that's an intentional bias that has creeped in. Interesting. So, I want to go back. So we were sure. talking about, and you may, you may have mentioned this in terms of the, the back end analysis, because that may be part of your answer here, but I'm, I'm curious about this. I was thinking about, you know, say I work for an organization and they do their performance reviews or whatever, it's five point scale. And they really, really try hard to, uh, you know, have three be the average, you know, right. they, they really try to anchor towards that middle and what have you. But then another five point scale, I use the example of the Lyfts and Ubers and Netflixes out there, where if it's not a five, it's horrible. Like right. it, it's basically created this binary scale where, especially like the Ubers and Lyfts, I know Netflix has done some things to evolve the, to an up down. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the ride shares fascinate me because I feel so compelled to rate somebody a five because I don't want them to lose their job <laughs> over the four I give them. Right. And so like I literally yesterday had to take a ride and, took a ride and the driver like was a wannabe NASCAR person. He cut 10 minutes <laughs> off a 30 minute ride. I'm like, how do you even do that mathematically? It, it was just amazing. And his car felt like it was going to fall apart. And I was terrified for my life. It was the first lift ride I'd taken in a year. And I'm like, I'm like, this is horrible. And then it got to the point where it was time to rate him. And I'm like, well, I guess I'll give him a five. He got me there. And it was right. like, it, like, this is the wrong thing, but I can't beat the system here is it broken or am I just overthinking it? <laughs> no, no, I, I, I um, I, you know, this, I hadn't thought about it from a broken standpoint. I think it needs some significant upgrades. And, and you just mentioned something that I, I, I think we overlook 
um, and I think poll pollsters even and market researchers overlook, is that there are so many different values assigned on a one to five scale. So you get in a lift and you think that that far right star, the five, mm -hmm. you know, like that's excellent or whatever. And, and, but you don't know whether it's excellent or not. You just think five stars. So implicitly you're like five stars means excellent. The scaling that we have used traditionally used to be pretty finite. I mean, it had a very um, deliberate and have a very serious implication for how you interpreted the numbers. Now the scaling is all over the map. I mean, even if you use a one to five scale, you can describe, you know, bad, 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 good, fantastic. And that, you know, so I think you're, you're, you, you've hit on something that is, is um, both for the researcher is a struggle, but for the respondent, you know, you're, you know, you're conditioned to be like, okay, I'm going to do a five. I'm going to do a five. I'm going to do a five. And, and the other part too, that I think is when we talked about this earlier is that a lot of researchers write the question to be rational when in a lot of ways, your response is completely irrational. It has something mm -hmm. to do with something completely different. So how you felt, not your opinion about it. Um, I, one thing about political polling, which, um, you know, our firm does or works with companies that do that. Um, and the, the numbers are, have not picked up the intensity, the frustration, the anger that voters are seeing and, and, mm -hmm. or that, that they're, exp they're, they're demonstrating in their behavior, but also they're saying, and, you know, on message boards and things like that. Mm -hmm. And because it, let's say it's a, you know, the score is a 3.5 for whatever is that we will water down those results because it's but it's not measuring the intensity and i think that's where there, there could be a big room for improvement is designing questions to measure intensity not just measure opinion um and i think that's and, and or or you know and, and that's in, on mm -hmm. you know branding research that's on anything is that you know um and you probably since you know you're you know you travel you know you'll get did this experience change my opinion about the brand? Well, most of the experiences you would have are transactional. And unless you have a really good one or a really bad one, it's kind of, a, you know, it's a neutral question. And the researchers are hoping that it's neutral because that gives them the justification, hey, we're doing our job. We're doing this. You know, if mm -hmm. you call a call center or things like that and rate the person after the call, that's, you know, like you said, from a performance standpoint, they love threes because that, you know, that's kind of the great equalizer. Um, but I do think that that's... It, it, the how people are using the data on the back end, um, both in terms of the calculations, but also in terms of the interpretation, that has shifted, I think, really mm -hmm. greatly. And I, as you know, I mentioned before, I think we all think our, of ourselves as you know data consultants in one regard because we're you know we see so much of it. Um, but um, you know it, the how they're using it and the intention that they're in, uh, ascribing to the different statistics, um, you know, that that's very different. And that, I think, that inconsistency, I think, confuses, you know, you and I and anybody else who, who you know, gets a call or takes a survey or, you know, wants to, you know, provide our opinion. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's fascinating mm -hmm. to think about how the back end is trying to error correct for these inconsistencies or, or like to your point, how strongly people feel about the number that they're giving or what have you, or I'm sure doing analysis like, hey, Anthony always gives a five on anything. If he gives a one on something, maybe we take that more seriously than the person who gives 80% ones and very rarely gives anything else, you know? And so yep. I see how that could be done just purely from a, a mathematic basis. And that's that's really interesting. And, and there was one thing in some of the, the topic listings that we had that I, I'm, I'm interested in talking with you because we've talked a lot about like message boards and, and some of that qualitative side of things. Um, and, and one of the things, and I have some exposure to this in different parts, but I'm certainly no expert on it, um, talking about how structuring unstructured data. So how yep. do we, or how do you, in your, um, in your work, take and quantify, assume there's a quantification component to this, how do you structure that unstructured data so that you can bring that and understand some of that nuance to help in the effort of correcting some of these biases, intentional or not, that we ultimately will have? Yeah, it's it's a great question because it and it's a struggle. Can you know? I still can um, 
it still can be fraught with errors and things like that. I mean, the, the basic way to do it is to look at all of the information that you have that surrounds that unstructured data. So for example, timestamps are pretty popular. Are there any, um, are there any attribute data available um, that would help context? So for example, on the message board, you know, we have, let's say a thousand comments. We know that 50 of them came from Minnesota, 200 came from Illinois. You know, we can start mm -hmm. looking at, at some of the, the ancillary data that's mm -hmm. collected along with this to begin to structure it out. And then we will start looking for patterns within the unstructured data that would give us clues as to, so for example, if we see the word, you know, good a lot, that would be a signal to us that there might be something. And then we take a look, if we look at for patterns within the, the, the natural language that people are using to describe it. Um, mm -hmm. the, one of the techniques I know that we've, we've used is, um, and I, I've done some work in uh, the entertainment industry. There is a correlation between the longer your review is, the better the film was. So oh. that, you know, so if you look at word count alone, that's one, but if you look at, you know, okay, this person had a, a more, so, you know, there, there are different techniques to look at the patterns of, of how that data came. Now that uh, artificial intelligence is becoming, you know, so much more, you can do a lot more. And what's happened in is now, thank goodness that everybody's saved all this data that they've collected. They've gone back into those data sets run these analyses and then created these models hoping to say here's the you know the next algorithm that's going to be able to be used to do this i'll, I'll use um there's a major pharmacy 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 company that i used to work with um, and we did a project with them using a, a real initial version of ai where it was 250,000 responses from about 5 million people you know and mm -hmm. they, they were all typed in we segmented them by mobile phone, by PC, where they were coming from, timestamps, how quickly, you know, for example, did you respond immediately after the transaction? Did it take you a day? Did it take you two? We clustered all of the data within, you know, these categories. And, and that's that was the umbrella structure that we used was those. And then we went and dug in and said, OK, everybody who said that uh, or reacted within 15 minutes of leaving a particular store, we were able to look at that. And, you know, so you there were you know, it, it really just sat down and said, this is the data map we want to use, or here are the things that are important to us, um, you know, length of response or, you know, any of this. And again, the science is evolving. There's no one correct way to do it. But when you start looking at what you have, you can go say, I really think this would be a, a good way to look at it. And then you can run it. It doesn't mean you have to use it, but there's more flexibility in being able to do that analysis now than before. Yeah, I, I like to think of like going back and looking at old data kind of reminds it's like how we're able to go and remaster old films like this is why yeah. we say if it, when when in doubt capture data capture insights record better you can figure out what you're going to do later but if you miss the opportunity to get that data and to get that source information exactly. in that moment it goes away forever and so that's really and I, and I really liked too the the role of metadata and some of that structured contextual data around the unstructured text in that message because you're right there's we know where that person's from we know when they post this exactly. these are these are are structured data metadata around the thing that you really care about which is their opinion or what have you but even things like the length that that's something i never thought of right like the yeah. length of the the answer gives us a signal that we can then use for interpretation. And that's really, that's really cool. And I mean, like nobody out there don't use that in isolation yeah. say, Oh, <laughs> our, our net promoter scores have gone through the roof because everybody's posting long messages. No, no, no. So, but there's, but that's where I think, you know, just knowing a little bit, granted it can be dangerous, but knowing a little bit kind of opens up this world. And this is why we do this show is that it, it gives people a taste of something that maybe they hadn't thought about before. Maybe it, it's something that they didn't have much exposure to, or didn't have that opportunity to take a class and learn about these things. So I really yeah. appreciate that. Well, and, In the last it, minute or two that, sure. that we have, um, what advice do you have for those organizations where they have just realized, oh, man, we should be doing more with this, and I don't even know where to go? What, what would you say good places to start, things to think about? You know, uh, it's a great question. In fact, I'm facing it with a couple clients right now. Um, the first thing is to 
know that you're not alone and that there are other people within your organization that are struggling with the same question. Um, what I have told several of my clients is just even to form like a three, five person task force just to take an inventory and an audit of what you actually think you have, because what you think you have is probably different than what you actually have. And mm -hmm. getting that outside perspective, or at least that secondary internal perspective is really pretty good. Um, the, the next is what you had said earlier, and that is don't stop data flow. Keep collecting it, keep using it, keep, um, keep the pipes open for allowing that data because you don't want to get into a situation where you do cut off critical pieces of information coming in. Um, and so I, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm working with a company right now who wanted to, you know, because of the PII rules, um, wanted to cut off. And I said, no, 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 that's not PII. You can continue to do that. So, you know, please keep collecting it because it's important for what, what we need. Um, the third thing is to just allow yourself the time to think about what you what, what you want out of the data. Because I think, in, I was thinking about this before we were talking, so many e-commerce sites allow you to go in and, you know, basically query, I want to fly from Chicago to Baltimore and, you know, type it in and you get a price or whatever. With the type of data that we work with, it's not a query system. You've got to really think about, okay, I want to look at I want to look at Netflix subscribers who live in the Midwest, who at least watch two hours of Netflix a week and, and have watched The Crown in the last six months. Well, those are four mm -hmm. attributes right there that if you don't, you know, that's the kind of thing that I think people really need to start taking a harder look at or, or piecing together. Does you shopping or does shopping at Barnes and Noble actually translate into anything related to any other, say, entertainment category, gaming category. And I think that's the thing is that the, we don't spend enough time asking those questions. We think, oh, because the person shops at Kroger, this is, this is, a, this is a Kroger shopper. And it's really not that monolithic, you know, so mm -hmm. challenging that, challenging some of the assumptions around it. Um, the fourth is don't skimp on investing in it. Um, I think mm -hmm. a lot, because data is so cheap and there's so much of it is that there's not enough money being spent on mining it. And, 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 and like you said, spending enough time on structuring it or putting it into a platform that can help you manipulate the data and work with it in a, in a constructive way. Um, you know, I, 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 I see too many mistakes being made by saying, Oh, we're just going to do, we're just going to use Excel to figure this out. And, and Excel's got a lot of power, no doubt about it. But, you know, some of these, it takes more sophisticated tools. So Absolutely. Well, Peter, we are all out of time. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Like the, the insights of this are, are fantastic. So oh. thank you for sharing that with us and, and being on the show today. No, thank you so much, Anthony. Really a pleasure to talk to you and have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks, you too. And thank you all for joining us today. You'll find more information and links in the show notes. Dive deeper with my book at dataleadershipbook.com and use promo code AlgmanDL at the Dataversity Online Training Center for 20% off your first purchase. And if you enjoy our show and would love your own but don't know where to start, visit algman.com to learn how we make having your own video podcast as easy as joining a call and sending an email. Stay safe during these unusual times and go make an impact. 